Did any of the following actually happen as described in these scary stories? Recently, a notorious UFO publisher and horror movie producer known by such names as Mr. Creepo, Mr. UFO, and Timothy Green Beckley passed on here in Manhattan a few blocks away from where I'm recording this. He and I had met in 1992 at the old New York 14 Society meetings that he helped the legendary John A. Keel arrange. After the meetings, we would all go to Miss K's Deli, don't look for it, it doesn't exist any longer, and we'd have lunch upstairs. There would be fans of The Strange, as well as such figures as Ingo Swan and Antonio Huneus there with us, eating Miss K's deadly meatball sandwiches. Later on, Tim used to come on my local cable access show and sometimes he would give me entire episodes to run in my time slot when I needed a break. In one episode, we interviewed him and I remember we asked him if he believed all the stories in the books he published. His response was, No way! You think I'm crazy? <laughs> that was Tim. He and I did a fictional movie one time called Punk Rock Zombie Kung Fu Catfight that had him playing his Mr. Creepo character. In the film, Mr. Creepo ran the entire local rock scene from his secret lair. Tim was a rock and roller in real life, too. In fact, it was a member of KISS who dubbed him Mr. UFO in the first place. David Bowie mentioned Tim in his autobiography. Tim Beckley got around. One of his favorite subjects, which he would always return to, was the idea of a hollow earth underneath us, populated with all sorts of fantastic beings. When he was still a kid living with his mom, Tim was pen pals with Richard Shaver, the man who either created or was victimized by the Dero or detrimental robots who he claimed lived under the ground. Shaver would mail Tim rocks he had split open, and Shaver insisted that the insides of the rocks were telling the history of humanity being abused and harassed by the underground Dero. The broken open stones arrived by mail in boxes with dirt, bugs, and worms, so Tim's mom did not appreciate the correspondence very much. Tim could be fascinated by a story without caring if it was true or if the person telling it was a schizophrenic. It was all the same to him, and I suppose that was a big overlap between us, our love of the weird and the strange. Today, in tribute to Tim, I've got a brand new story allegedly about Dogman living underground. After that, we've got a special treat for you as Tim himself will read you a story we recorded together decades ago in a recording studio in Chappaqua, New York that doesn't exist any longer. He will tell you the tale of two young men who wanted to investigate an allegedly haunted mine, but who encountered a terrifying cryptid instead. It's fun to imagine that all of Tim's stories are for real, and maybe they actually were. It's just as fun to imagine Tim looking down from wherever he is now, listening to these stories, and then shouting at me, Hey, Bigfoot, you still owe me 70 bucks. So now, get comfortable. And then Tim and I will tell you two creepy tales of what might be going on under our feet right now. And the first of these two tales is the one we call Dogman in the Cave Park. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a Dogman story for you. This happened to me and my older brother who we can call Seth, although that is not his real name. This was way back before life got all stupid and crazy, back in I think 2007-ish, maybe 2008. That would have made me 17 or 18, and my brother 21 or 22. We were both working a job in Maryland in those days, a shipping and moving business that our father started which he told us we would inherit. He ended up selling the business to our main competitor in 2010, and only telling us after the deal was done, but that's a story for another day. At the point when this all happened, we were highly motivated young employees of our dad and we were taking a very well-deserved week off to go camping together. We decided to go someplace local to chill out and ended up finding ourselves at Killiansburg Cave, just off the shore of the Potomac River, 
right on the border between Maryland and West Virginia. There are a few official campgrounds there, or there were back when we went there 14 or so years back at least. We walked into the location on our own, not driving in as most people would do. Because of this, we didn't realize we had to pay to use the campsite that we started setting up camp in. This comes into play later, which is why I'm mentioning it. While we were setting up camp, we kept hearing barking in the distance. It was frequent enough and annoying enough that we talked about it. I remember Seth saying he sure hoped that stupid dog wasn't going to bark through our entire weekend together. I was actually concerned that the dog might be trapped or injured because the barking sounded so strange and was also just ridiculously persistent. As night fell, the barking seemed to stop and we built a fire, although neither of us was hungry enough yet for dinner. It was a really beautiful, gorgeous sunset as we got a visit from a man who seemed very angry at us for some reason. It turned out he was working for the campgrounds and he was the guy we were supposed to pay for the right to use that patch of dirt for the night. Since we were both young, he just assumed we had no cash on us and that we were troublemakers out to wreck his business. As it turned out, he only needed us to pay 10 or $15, I think, maybe 20 and to show some ID. He was insisting we needed to go back to the office, but Seth was trying to settle our debt on the spot, saying we'd be happy to check in at the office in the morning. While my brother was negotiating with the guy, I began to hear dog sounds in the woods around us again. It wasn't barking this time though, it was a growling kind of a sound. It was so deep that I almost wondered if it might be something other than a dog, like a bear for instance. I remember interrupting Seth's conversation with the park worker to ask both of them if they knew what a bear's growl sounded like. Neither of them had noticed the growling at all, and so they stopped talking to listen. At that moment, out of the trees burst this figure that is really hard to describe. I've seen images and drawings of what Dogman is supposed to look like, and this creature looked more like that than like anything else I can think of. That having been said, it did not look exactly like the generic image of Dogman as it exists in 2021 when I'm typing this down. This was a hairy man, make no mistake about it, and his legs look like the hind legs of a canine. But he had a very long snout, a long and narrow snout, much longer and far narrower than any canine I had ever seen before. He also had carnivorous, dangerous looking teeth so large that at first I thought he was wearing ill-fitting dentures. It had dog ears up on top of its head, just exactly as you often show in your thumbnails, and its eyes glowed bright white. I don't mean it had eye shine, I mean its eyes were clearly lit from within as though it were used to walking around in darkness. Its arms were a mix of human and canine arms, possessing features of both, but fully resembling neither. I suppose they were a bit more muscular than a dog's arms would normally be, but not outrageously so. It had very large dog paws, but they were not hands or claws as is sometimes depicted in the modern literature. My brother was asking the parks guy if he carried a firearm, and he looked at Seth like he was crazy. The dogman was about seven feet tall when standing upright like that, and it was growling and advancing on us. It looked to me like he was very hungry, and, lacking any weapon to defend ourselves, I honestly thought that we were goners. That was when my brother Seth's quick thinking came into play. He grabbed the hot dogs that we were going to be having for dinner, and he tossed them in the direction of the growling monster. The dogman did not seem to understand that this was an offering of food at first, a bribe to leave us alone. The creature seemed somewhat blind, to be honest, and looked to be agitated by the light of our fire. When the hot dogs came flying his way, he dropped to all fours and began barking furiously, that same bark we had been hearing all day. While snarling and roaring at us, though, the creature began to smell the hot dogs. He sniffed at them almost comically. 
that picked them up gingerly with his teeth and retreated into the woods, presumably to dine in private. Seth told me to pack what I could grab as he began tossing dirt on the fire to put it out. He asked the parks guy if we could come back in the morning to retrieve our tent and gear, and the guy acted like he didn't understand why we were suddenly wanting to leave. Didn't you see that thing? Seth asked him. It was like a cross between a dog and a bear, I said angrily. The dude started giving us this line that it was just an escaped family dog and not a threat at all. Can you imagine? Something with a prehistoric dog snout that stood on its hind legs seven feet tall and had glowing eyes? Oh yeah, that's just Fido wanting to play fetch. Nothing to see here. So we went back to the stupid office and paid to have the campsite overnight even though we were leaving. We didn't want our stuff to get thrown out before the sun came up so we could go back and get it. And we didn't want to stay there in the dark with that cave dog thing wandering around. Besides, we'd given it our dinner, and so now we needed to go get something else to eat somewhere else. So both Seth and I think that it's just too big a coincidence that we were camping near a famous cave when we saw this animal with glowing eyes that seemed to be blinded by bright light and flames. We think the glowing white eyes were a sign that this creature lived underground in a world with very little light. Possibly it was barking and whining all day long out of its confusion resulting from being out on the surface during the daylight hours. It must have, in our estimation, wandered out of the cave system by accident, and I hope it found its way back underground soon after that. We both also think the Dogman must have come from very deep underground because if it lived near the surface of a very famous cave, it would certainly have been seen and noted by scientists long, long ago. I don't know if that theory would explain all Dogman sightings, but my brother and I feel pretty certain that it satisfies our sighting of the Dogman in the cave park. Next, the late, great Timothy Green Beckley is going to tell you another story of an underground cryptid. But first, we need to thank tonight's executive producer, Megara Opheim. Megara, Megara, she's got a certain flair. She deserves our top rhyme, because she's Megara Opheim. Please join us in thanking Megara Opheim, without whom this episode would not have been possible. Megara joined our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com, and so she gets to listen to our secret uncensored Sunday Night Dogman stories, as well as our over 15 hours of archive stories. You can hear them too, by either doing what Megara did, or else by clicking the join link under this video and becoming a channel member. And now, it's Mr. Creepo time as our old friend Timothy Green Beckley regales us with his memories of Jersey City in the old days and the horrible nightmare that was the haunted mine. Take it away, Mr. Creepo. Continuing with our interest in the subterranean world, let me tell you the story of Mr. X. Back in the 1960s, I was good friends with a gentleman by the name of John J. Robinson. Jack lived over in Jersey City, and he was a collector, a massive collector of material on UFOs, the Shaver mystery, and anything unusual. We used to meet at Jack's house, oh, every couple of weeks, a group of us would sit around. Augie Roberts, well-known photographer who had taken snapshots of UFOs over the New York City skyline, and Dominic Lucchesi, who was always dabbling in free energy and anti-gravity devices he liked to tinker with. Jim Mosley, editor of uh, the Saucer News. We'd sit around and we'd bullshit for a jackpot just uh, up all night to the wee hours discussing these uh, subjects. Uh, Jack was a regular guest on the uh, all-night uh, talk show Long John Nebel. Uh, Long John was, of course, one of the pioneers, the main pioneer in late uh, night uh, talk shows. Took phone calls from uh, listeners in, in 30 states and had on a lot of people who claimed some pretty far out stuff from those like uh, Howard Menger and George Adamski who said 
that uh, they had taken trips on board flying saucers to other planets and said it in, in a very sincere manner and made you want to believe it to people like uh, Jack, who was an investigator and a collector. Uh, anyway, Jack related the story uh, to me, and I published it uh, in the Subterranean Worlds Inside Earth, and basically it's told in the words of Mr. X himself. Uh, Jack never did tell me the name of the individual, the actual name of the individual, because the fellow was not interested, as you can understand why, in just a few minutes, in any sort of publicity or to get his name around. He didn't want to be pestered by uh, investigators. He just wanted to keep to himself. So Mr. X's story starts as thus. When I was 17, I had just graduated from high school. I spent my summer vacation visiting a former schoolmate who had moved from Los Angeles. His family had moved to a small town northwest of Los Angeles. I will not tell you the state of the town, for when I finish you might try to investigate, and since I lost one friend, I have no wish to lose another. My boyhood's friend's name was Fred, and we had arranged that I would visit him for the summer whenever I graduated. I arrived at the bus station of his town, and Fred met me at the station. He took me to his home, where it was arranged that we would share the room in the attic while I visited. Fred had borrowed a bike for my use that summer, and we started to make trips to the country toward the north of town, where the country was wild and still mountainous. The town was located south of a group of mountains, which, while they were not too high, were high enough for us to enjoy climbing about. One day, Fred told me that he would have to spend the next day minding his sister's children. He said he would take a late afternoon bus and travel to his sister's home about 25 miles away. He was going to stay overnight so his sister and her husband could start, uh, start early the next morning on a business trip. But he told me, I'm only be gone for the day. You can have a room for yourself. I'll be home late the next night. Fred suggested that since he had to leave on the late bus, we visit a place even he had never been to, a section of country only three hours of fast cycling from the town. It was a place the townspeople called the Haunted Mine. The townspeople usually avoided it, he said. I asked him why the mine was said to be haunted, and he told me that the people who had dug the mine ran into some sort of long cave like a tunnel, after they had dug down quite a ways. It was after this that they had had trouble. What sort of trouble, Mr. X wanted to know. Well, he didn't exactly know, but according to what he had heard, miners had been killed when portions of this tunnel fell in on them. Other miners had disappeared, and he understood that a couple of the deaths of investors in the mine had been seemingly strange, but he didn't really have all the details. At any rate, all the trouble seemed to start after they broke into this underground space. The mine had evidently petered out, and it was deserted as a complete loss. No one visited the mine or lived near it anymore. I asked Fred how we would manage to locate the mine if he had never been there. But Fred said that a friend of his had visited the mine and told him about the roads and how to locate it. When I asked Fred, my friend, if he could persuade his friend to go along, Fred said that the friend had broken his neck falling from a cliff he was climbing the day after he had visited the mine. That's odd, isn't it, I asked Fred, and he told me the only thing odd about it was that his friend had climbed the cliff when a path leading to the top was only a ten-minute walk from where he was found clutching a piece of black cloth in his hand. I guess he spotted the piece of black cloth climbed up to get it, and fell when he reached for it. We started out for the Hornet Mine early that morning and cycled on, increasingly poorer roads, until we were somewhere way up in the mountains. We had to leave our bicycles because the road we came to was so bad that it was impassable. Fallen trees and large rocks had rolled down the side of the mountains. We left our cycles and started to climb up the road. Fred told me the opening to the mine was located on that road, but that 
The road led around the other side of the mountain. We climbed the road for about 20 minutes, and then we rounded the mountain and came upon a spur of rock. When we continued on the road around the rock, we came to a cleared area which had several deserted buildings standing together on the edge of the mountain. Past the buildings loomed a pile of debris which had evidently been dug from the ground and allowed to slide past the top of the pile down the side of the mountain. The entrance to the mine was evidently located behind one of the buildings and on the other side of the pile of debris. We passed the building and start, started around the pile from the mine when suddenly we came to the entrance. It was then we saw it. Standing on the edge of the mine as if on guard was the most frightening creature I had ever seen. The being, that's what I call him, the being was about four and a half feet tall, but very large around, with eyes large and circular, and the head seemed to be covered with a sort of hood. While it seemed to have wings which were folded around in front of it, we saw no arms. The portion of the body on what might be a person's chest was covered with large scales of almost a reptilian nature, like the skin of a huge snake. There was a projection that seemed to come up from what might be termed the shoulders and outline the back of the lower portion of the head. The being, the creature, whatever you want to call it, had no neck projecting behind it like a spread cloak seemed to be a huge bird-like tail. The legs were short and chunky, and the feet, if that's what they were, seemed to be encased in a sort of box-like boot, or if it were not a boot, to be more like the type of a hoof. What appeared to be the face had eyes and a mouth, and with what might have been termed a nose, it reminded me of the look of a demon from hell. Frightening story, you bet, and it goes on. Mr. X continues. When the being saw us, it let out a scream, ah, like an animal, and started around the edge of the mine towards us. It rustled its wings or cloak as if it had arms, but we did not stop to see. We broke out of the paralysis of fright and wheeled in retreat at full speed, we covered the 20 more minutes of hillside road in less than five. Believe me, we got out of there in a hurry. We grabbed our bicycles and set off at breakneck speed over the road for home. We rode so fast that we covered that three-hour journey in less than two and a half hours. Fred drove directly to the bus station where he checked his cycle and got on the bus, which took off before the one he had expected to take. I locked my bike outside the local motion picture theater and took in the show. During the latter part of the picture, I noticed a rather short person with a dark face, even in the dim theater, who seemed to be going up and down the aisle, evidently looking for someone. He seemed to stop very often at the row of seats I was in and glanced down them in my direction. At the end of the picture, I left the show with a crowd of people. As I started to ride my cycle home to Fred's house, I felt as if someone or something was following me. And at some of the street intersections, I noticed people who seemed to be similar to the person dressed in black who had prowled the aisles of the theater. When I passed rapidly, these people always seemed to be watching me. But since it was dark by then, I couldn't be sure. At one time, a short person dressed in black dived out of an alley toward me on a deserted street. But I swerved around and, and continued on my journey back to Fred's house. I rode frantically down a tree-covered lane toward home, or at least where I was staying, when suddenly a huge limb of a tree broke off above me. Were it not for my speed, the limb would have crushed me beneath it. As it was, the leaves on the outermost branches whipped across my back and the rear wheel of my bicycle. I arrived at Fred's home and drove up the driveway, leaving my cycle at the foot of the porch. I dived up the stairs and rang the bell frantically. 
As I did so, I noticed a short figure start towards the house from a corner about 200 yards away. Fred's mother answered the door, and I told her that I was tired and was going to bed at once. When I reached the attic room, I drew the blinds and lit the lights and packed all my clothes. After that, I put out the light and cracked the blind. As I looked out, I felt sure that I could see a dark form squatting in the tree limb, which came close to the window in the nearest tree. Although the night was hot, I did not open the window, nor did I sleep at all. Instead, I kept watch all that night, and I know that there was someone in that tree, for his shadow drifted down the side of the tree and crossed the lawn shortly before daylight. In the morning, I told Fred's mother that I had called home that evening from a pay station and that my parents had asked me to return home at once. I left for Los Angeles on the first bus that morning and kept a close watch to make sure I was not being followed. After I arrived home, I waited a day and then went to a pay station and called Fred. His mother said that Fred had arrived home the day I left, but that he had gone off on his bicycle that morning. To make a long story short, Fred's cycle was later found at the beginning of the impassable road to the haunted mine. To this day, Fred has never been found, and to this day I am afraid that whoever or whatever it was that got Fred could find me. Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it. You can become a channel member by clicking the join link below. Then you can check our community page to find the links to 10 hours or more of secret, uncensored dogman stories too wild to be told on this channel. Your other option is to join our paid subscribers club at peterbernard.com. That's Peter's homemade club where he will personally email you the links as well as occasional secret clubs. Club messages. You may also be included as an executive producer in a future episode. You have a scary experience you want to tell us about? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or else call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804 Less Scary. The machine cuts off every few minutes, so if you have a long story, please keep calling back and we'll piece it together later on. Good night and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more scary stories.